Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. Welcome back for another episode. Regular episode this week. Regular episode this week. I know I feel like we've been working on so much bonus stuff that when we record a regular episode, I'm like, oh, it's just normal. (laughs) So just for reference, guys, it is about 1.30 in the afternoon and I just woke Madison up out of bed. (laughs) Yeah. And I only like cracked her door open to make sure she was breathing, not to even wake her up. I was already kind of awake though. Anyway, so we are back today. This episode will post right after we get back from our trip actually. Today, we are bringing you The Disappearance at Aldridge Cove, which comes to us all the way from Australia. So this case takes place in early September of 2013. 40-year-old Rowan Wallace Cook, he was an IT professional from Sydney, Australia. He made the 3,930-kilometer or 2,442-mile drive from his home in Perth, Western Australia, on the opposite coast, which has a three-hour time difference, by the way. So most people complete this drive over four to ten days across the Great Australian Bight, through the Nullarbor Plain. It's almost treeless, arid, and sparsely populated area. Right, so kind of like a desolate type area. Four to ten days. I mean, that's a long drive for that. We could probably squish that into the lower end of days because we're we're like a power through kind of when we're trying to get somewhere. Kind of an interesting fact, you guys. He actually donated his possessions to charity. So maybe he was planning on being gone for a while. Because he did this before he left. On August 12, Cook bought 500 odd or 387 USD worth of fuel from Coffs Harbor to get him across this single tarmac road because there's not gas stations along the way. That's terrifying. That is terrifying. When I went to go pick you up at Wonderland and stopped at the last gas station, I got you guys Cokes and stuff, but it said this is the last gas station for like 2,000 miles. Yeah. It was like fuel up here or die in the woods. Yeah. Literally. (laughs) Basically. (laughs) And I was like, this absolutely terrified. I I mean, I have a full tank of gas, so nothing's going to happen. Like I filled up the rest of the tank and I was like... Nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to die. But this still scares me that there's no gas station. It's pretty scary. Yeah. So running close to the southern coast that connects the east and the west of Australia is where this road is. Once in Western Australia, Cook took the scenic route into the city, staying a night at Esperance and three days in Denmark, adding a few days to his journey. Cook had been a lover of the great outdoors since his birth. His family shared grazing property outside of Goldburn, which is 195 kilometers or 121 miles southwest of Sydney. Because I think most people know where Sydney is or have heard of it. There he learned about country life and developed his bush skills. So it definitely sounds like he was kind of almost bred for this type of adventuring. Okay, arriving in Perth, he put his four-wheeled vehicle into storage. He told the manager of the storage facility that he was planning on undertaking a bushwalk. Which I'm guessing is like a backpacking trip or a hiking trip. Like a trek, just like... Yeah, like bushwhacking, I think, or bushwalking is like... Because the bush... Remember, the bush in Australia is like the woods. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not like a bunch of bushes. Like Maddie thought when we no, did our Australian is, case. I did not think that. I actually <laughs> knew before we did that case that that's what that meant. Okay. No. But you were like, he walked into a bush. And I'm like, no, he walked into the bush. And she's like, what? <laughs> he got on a trans WA bus to Walpole, a town approximately 410 kilometers or 225 miles south of Perth. He arrived at about 640 p.m. He was carrying lightweight camping equipment. He was equipped with a backpack, a one-man tent, a light tarpaulin, 
What's a tarpaulin? It's like a a tarp that you would use instead of a tent. So you hang it above like your sleeping bag. You're just on the ground though. So oh, it's just like a tarp. Like the one we have for like our, our, our hammocks. Like yeah. Our, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. A light tarpaulin, which is a little tarp mm-hmm. house thing. It's not super little, but yeah. Well, yeah, it's not really little. Yeah. And we'll post a picture of the tarpaulin since Maddie made it real clear. <laughs> Go. You don't have to. I just didn't know what a tarpaulin was until you just explained it to me. <laughs> and I hike, and I didn't know what it was, okay? We don't call it that here, but yeah, it makes sense, yeah. Sleeping and cooking gear and provisions. So, like, probably food, water, stuff like that. Yeah. He actually left his larger gear in his vehicle. So, a 300-odd or 234 USD new tent. So, I mean, that's an expensive tent, which he bought on July 25, 2013. A new solar panel, which he bought in February of 2013. So these are two expensive pieces of gear that he bought this year, but did not take with him on the actual hike. Maybe he had planned on taking those on another trip that he was going to go on, or maybe he decided that he just didn't like them for this trip. What I think is that he was definitely planning on going on more trips, right? He donated his stuff. He put his car in storage. I think that he was planning on spending a long time out here. But for this particular trek, he didn't feel like he needed the larger items. Maybe yeah. it's not cold enough yet for them because I am assuming he bought these to last him longer into the colder months. Mm-hmm. His laptop, however, was not found in his vehicle. So the assumption is that he must have taken it with him. So September in Western Australia is springtime, moving into its trademark sunny weather, which is which super is weird because that's about. when like our winter starts. Yeah, yeah. September's yeah. when it starts getting cold and fall starts to come, and then yeah. I start to be like, oh my god, it's about to get way colder. So Walpole, however, is situated on the coast, surrounded by national parks and forest, with max average temperatures of seventeen degrees Celsius or sixty three degrees Fahrenheit. So that's not terrible weather. I've definitely done backpacking trips, 60 degree weather. You know, a little rain, a little sun, you get Uh a little bit of everything. Spring is a nice time to hike. Mm -hmm. Cook as a child was quiet, but happy and sociable. He was a cub and a venturer scout and enjoyed, what is it, upselling? So it's basically like a form of rock climbing. Okay. Hiking and boating. He was a strong swimmer. He was part of Manly Nippers Surf Lifesaving Club. Yeah. So when when I first read this, I was like, what? Manly's actually the town. Okay. So when I heard Manly Nippers Surf right. Lifesaving Club. <laughs> but Manly is a part of Sydney, okay. which is about as stereotypical as Australia lifestyle can be. So... Manly's like a place. So they're the Manly Nippers Surf Club. They're not about Manly Nippers. Okay. Which I like it. I like the name. Yeah. I like it. (laughs) Me too. When I first read it though, I was like, wait, what? And then I had to look it up and I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. It's fine. That makes sense. Yeah. So this was a renowned surf spot just across the city from Bondi Beach. This setting may have helped foster Cook's love for the outdoors because he spent all of his time outdoors. Mm -hmm. So in 1995, after graduating from university, Cook was not exactly one for the straight and narrow, like a nine to five. After only six months on the job as a computer programmer, he resigned and spent the next month exploring the Sydney coastline from Palm Beach to Manly, living rough and camping in caves. Kind of cool. I know he liked caves for sure. He would like go and seek them out and explore them and things like that. Yeah. Caves are cool. Caves kind of scare me as well, though. It's like a... I know, but I still like them. It's like I'm very intrigued, but also a little we scared. Always, we always go into them, but we're always a little scared. Um, I did not go into the animal den, though. You did not. I did. It's fine. No. I wasn't it was eaten. Definitely I wasn't eaten by anything. It like a fine. cougar den. And my mother walked into it. I wanted to know if something was sleeping in there. <laughs> yeah, you want to know if a mountain lion's sleeping in their cave, in their den, their home? Yeah. Mom. <laughs> Mom. 
I survived. No, it's I fine. am much more afraid of cougars and big cats than I am of bears. I'd much rather run into else. a bear, but it could have been a bear. We're just pretty sure it wasn't a bear cave. By the shape of the cave and just how the, the there's like a tree across it and just how you could see the dirt of... It definitely looked like a cat, a cat den, not a bear den. But there was nothing in there. It was fine. Yeah, because it was up exploring our campsite. <laughs> it did have a really strong animal scent to it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if you missed that story a long time ago, because that was a really long time ago was that we told ago, that. Yeah. When we came back to our campsite after doing some more exploring, there was animal spray all around our campsite. Yeah. Like fresh animal spray because we got back and we we're like sitting playing cards and we're like, why are there so many flies all over the place? What the hell is happening? Yeah. Then we go looking and like all around the perimeter of our campsite is just spray. That's also the same day that we packed up and left because of the creepy suspender guy that was not wearing hiking clothes and had no water and had come from our campsite. Super creepy. We got a really bad feeling and we ended up packing up and leaving that night. Otherwise, we might have been eaten by something. It's fine. Okay. I'd much rather be eaten by a mountain lion than killed by a man, so. I could get on board with that. I think that would be better. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Let us know what you guys think. We'll, we'll do a poll on Instagram. <laughs> would you rather be eaten by a mountain lion or killed by a man? Would you rather be mauled to death by a cougar? Or killed by a human? Or killed by a creepy suspender man? In 1999, he worked casually as a security officer in bars and nightclubs. During this period, he was studying Buddhism and martial arts. Gaining a black belt and it was either karate or ninjutsu. Either way, pretty badass. Both martial arts. Yeah. It is badass. Also, he was apparently a big fan of World of Warcraft, which I think is a video game. Yes. You would be correct. Okay. So in 2001, he began- Which is the year Maddie was born. Yes. If you want to uh, feel old. He began work for a friend of his brother's in the IT area- at nightclubs. Scanning IDs in 2001? Yeah. Uh, not sure exactly what that entails, but I'm assuming it was a little more than just like scanning IDs for him if he was in the IT department. So maybe like helping develop the software for scanning IDs or something along those lines. Remember that the O'Hayes case that we did, the Cheeky Monkey, their nightclub actually had like an ID scanner at it. So maybe something like that? Maybe. I don't know. Our nightclubs still use like the old fashioned way where the bouncer just like looks at it, holds the picture up next to your face and is like, oh, is this you? I don't know. And that's about it. (laughs) I've never seen an ID scanner personally. In 2005, he bought a four wheel drive with the aim of traveling around Australia. He stayed for extended periods in Darwin and Girraween. He earned an income as a web designer while traveling. And always kept in contact with his mom, Diane. Oh, that's so cute. So in February of 2008, Diane came to visit him in Western Australia, traveling over by train. Yeah, and the train that she would have taken is called the Indian Pacific. It is a single train line for commercial passengers to travel from Sydney to Perth. And it takes four days and three nights. It follows the path of bush pioneers and gold rush prospectors. That's kind of cool. That's very cool. I want to go take this train. We can when we go to Byron Bay eventually. I I mean, Byron Bay is like right over here. It's not that far of a stretch to get to that train line. Yeah, so so we'll start here. We'll take the train and then we'll travel up the coast to Byron Bay. That is great. Yep, great. Yeah. The two of them camped extensively in the Southwest, including the Wallapole area. That's so fun. How fun. Later that year, Cook had a falling out with his brother, Jeremy. Not Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay, everybody's always made fun of me for how I say that. I don't know. I guess they say it weird. I don't know. From court documents, it is understood that Cook mistakenly believed that his brother had been having an affair with the ex-partner of a friend of theirs. In early January of 2009, Cook completed the Bibbulmun track And almost 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles walking trail from Perth to Albany. Right, which this is something that I really, really want to do. So to give 
Americans a bit of a grasp of how far this is, it would be like walking from Denver to Kansas City. Yeah, which is crazy. I definitely, it looks amazing. Most people complete it in stages over long weekends, but the adventurous few try it in the full distance. So, I mean, kind of like the Appalachian Trail or something like that. Like a lot of people don't do it in one sitting, but the most adventurous ones will do it in one sitting. Okay, so the Bibbleman Track is a long distance walking trail running from Perth Hills to Albany on the state's southernmost coast. A lot of this trek is along the coastline and then it kind of goes inland a little bit as it heads up towards Perth or starts inland and then heads down to the coast. From town to town, however, sections are lengthy. Some of them stretch up to 12 days long. So staying in a town after each day or completing sections as a day trek is not possible. The track is for walkers only. So no no kind of bikes or vehicles or off-terrain things are allowed on it. Which is pretty common for the long treks. Pretty common. There are 49 campsites along the track, which are roughly a day's walk apart between about six miles and 15 miles apart. Each campsite contains a three-sided timber shelter, a sit-down pedestal pit toilet, gotta love those, rainwater tank, picnic tables, tent sites, and some have a fireplace. So this actually sounds a lot like the campsites on Wonderland. No fireplaces, though, because you're not allowed to have fires there, but a little similar, yeah. Gotta love a pit toilet. So after completing this is when Diane, his mom, really noticed that her son began to change. He became more antisocial, brisk, judgmental, and argumentative. He told her that he had actively avoided interacting with other hikers on the trail, which is kind of a little unusual. I I think that's very unusual from... For through hikers anyway, like a lot of people who do these long treks, they really thrive off of interacting with each other, meeting up at campsites, meeting up in towns, trading stories, things like that. Yeah. Um, so, and it seems like these were really unusual behaviors for him. So that would be very concerning for sure. Oh, yeah. He was particular about his diet. He had taken up a restrictive diet and had even abstained from drugs and alcohol, and had began distancing himself from his family. Also another red flag. And it was not just Diane that noticed this change. His father, Roy, also noticed these changes. Which, if you really think about it, I mean, this is kind of an older age to be really changing like this. Mm -hmm. So I would also find this kind of alarming uh, if it was my family member, but also sometimes when people get more intimate with nature, they start to have a low tolerance for other people, and I can see that as well. So it could just be like whatever turmoil was going on in his life, he really started to enjoy this nature and being by himself and not being around people, and it sort of started to bleed into like all of his life. Possibility, yes. In April of 2010 or July of 2011, we're not really sure about the dates on this because the coroner's report actually posts it this way, which could just mean that the family couldn't remember when this happened. So Cook had called his father and then been verbally abusive with him when Roy mentioned seeing him in a photo of his friend and employer's wedding. Neither his mother or his father saw him in person again after this. I wonder why he got upset about that. It's so bizarre. Although Diane still received correspondence up until March of 2012, when one of her letters was returned unopened with the initials RTS, which means return to sender, on the front along with Cook's initials. What a weird. Yeah, you guys, I literally don't even know what I would do if my child sent back a letter, a letter like that without opening it. That's so sad. It's like worse than getting red, left on red. I know. It's like the extreme version. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Yeah. It's the old school version of being left on red. No, it's worse than being left <laughs> on red. It's like being left undelivered without them ever reading your message ever. Yeah. 
So Roy still thought of his son as a genuine person, honest and true to his word, but the family could not reconcile why Cook had withdrawn from them. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there was like an incident or something big that happened. It just seemed like he had started to withdraw from them for some reason. His brother Jeremy hypothesized that it may be the result of his deep interest in Buddhism and privacy, an attempt to live a more pure life in order to move to nirvana. Kind of like the Chris McCandless case, which if you guys remember was the Lost in the Wild episode that we did. So Chris McCandless actually has kind of a similar interaction with his family that we have here with Cook, right? Mm -hmm. Because Chris actually burned his money, burned his things, took off, stopped interacting with his family. I mean, it sounds like Cook did like a less dramatic version of that, but slowly is doing that disengaged from his normal life to start to live a different type of life. Yeah. Okay. So back to present day in our story at some stage between the 20th of September and the 2nd of October, Cook set up camp at Aldrich Cove about 12 kilometers or 7.5 miles west of Walpole in Walpole Nornaloop National Park. I am probably saying that wrong. Aldridge Cove is a remote coastal location only accessible via a section of the Bibbelman Track. This area is well known for its windy, wild weather, like much of the Southwest. On October 2nd, Cook went back into town, presumably by foot, and entered Walpool Hardware Supply, where he bought supplies including food, cooking gas, and candles, before walking back to his campsite off Aldridge Cove. And this was the last sighting of Rowan Wallace Cook that we know of. Yeah, which, I mean, he went into town for supplies. It sounds like he was intending on camping more, camping longer, all of that. Rowan is an average height of 174 centimeters or five foot seven. By the way, is like almost my height. So I would think that was a little short, actually. It maybe it's an average height in Australia. Australians, are you shorter than we are, averagely? Because I'm average height for a female. No. I'm, yeah, I'm 5'6". That's nope. average. 5'4 is average for a woman. Really? Yes. Are you sure? Yep. Positive, actually. I'm positive. And I think the average for men here is like 5'8 or 5'10". Really? Yeah. Okay, look up what is the average height of a man. Average height. Okay. So it looks like Madison is correct. The average for a man in the United States is 5'9", and the average for a woman is 5'4". Ah, 5'9". I was close. I said 5'8 or 5'10". Yeah, you were were right in there. So I didn't know that. I thought I was average height. Apparently, I'm a little above average because I'm 5'6". Well, Mom, that's why I'm so pissed that I'm short because both of my parents are above average height. Yeah, I'm a goddamn (laughs) midget. (laughs) I'm so short. The average height for a man in Australia is 5'9". The average height for a female in Australia is 5'3". Damn, so like I'm average height in Australia. You're not even. You're like (laughs) 5'2". Stop. I'm 5'3". So men are about the same and women are just a little bit shorter in Australia. You know what's even more interesting is that the number keeps going down. I know. Why are we getting shorter? I don't know. Apparently, red hair is going to be extinct someday, too. I've actually read recently that it will never be completely extinct. It'll just be really rare because it's so recessive. Okay. He also had brown eyes and brown hair. He had a fair complexion and a slim build. And here's where things get strange. On November 18, which is more than a month after the sighting of him in the hardware store, his abandoned campsite was located by a hiking group. You guys, we have literally like come across like abandoned campsites. It's terrifying. This particular hiking group, they actually stayed close to where the abandoned campsite was and they stayed there on the night of the 18th and the 19th of November. But they grew concerned when the tent was left undisturbed for their entire time there. Upon their return to Perth, one of the campers notified police that he had seen 
what he believed was an abandoned campsite, complete with a phone and personal effects. But he had not seen the owner of the campsite, which we have a picture of this campsite, you guys. And when you look at this campsite, there is no way that somebody intentionally walked away from this campsite. One, it's kind of in a sketchy location. It's definitely perched up on the rocks. So his tent is set up right on the rocks, right on the ocean. I mean, it it kind of looks like a sheer drop from his campsite, right? Which probably made for really good views in the morning. But think about getting up in the middle of the night from this campsite and trying to use the bathroom. Terrifying. Cliff edges scare me though. I've like, there was one cliff edge that I slept on one time and I had nightmares all night that I like got out of my tent and like just walked off the edge of the cliff for some reason. And I couldn't sleep all night. I did. It's like an intrusive thought nightmare. I know. On the 22nd of November, Walpole Police Sergeant Cameron Clifford inspected the abandoned campsite. The campsite was, quote unquote, clean and fastidious. 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 Fastidiously. 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 What the heck? Fast distally. No. Fast distally. No. Nope. Say it again. I don't know if I can now. Time. I can't. <laughs> my my brain's contaminated now. Oh, say it. Wait, we'll just leave this all in the podcast. <laughs> it was clean and maintained with no sign of disturbance. Yeah. So under his tarp was a backpack, a cooking stove, bags of packaged food, a mobile phone, with three quarters charged, clip seal bags containing shopping lists, a message indicating he would be back soon, 210 UD or 164 USD in notes, car keys for his vehicle, driver's license, and a bank card. You guys, this is not good. His rubbish, as well as litter that he found along the way, was carefully collected to take out of the campsite. So... He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, right? Not only has he been collecting his rubbish along the way, but he's also collected litter that he found while walking the trail as well, which we always do when we are out backpacking. Sergeant Clifford did determine that there were significant items missing from his gear, specifically a torch or a flashlight, as we know it's called here, a knife, a rain jacket, hiking boots, and pants. So these are all things that are assumed that he has on him because they're not in his tent. But these are all things that he would definitely have with him. Yeah, okay. So, like I said, these were assumed to be likely held on his person and may be indicative of his movements. Likely, he had left his campsite intentionally of his own volition, possibly at night, since the flashlight is missing. His call history revealed that his final calls were made on the 19th of September, almost a month before his campsite was found by the group of hikers. Notably, a laptop was not found at his campsite. Right, so the laptop is now not at his car and not at his campsite. Diane expressed surprise that her son's laptop was neither at the campsite or in his vehicle. This was something that his family could not answer. Right. If he were trying to remove himself from society, perhaps getting rid of a laptop would have been a likely step. Yeah. Because if you think about it, he's already gotten rid of his other belongings. He's not making calls on his cell phone. Maybe he just felt like he didn't need the laptop anymore. It is also unlikely that he would leave his campsite with his laptop, but not his phone. So we're thinking he didn't get up in the middle of the night, grab his knife, his rain jacket, and his boots... And then drag his laptop along. Obviously, that's probably not what happened. So over the next five days, police officers began their investigation and a search got underway. His disappearance and the subsequent search were complicated by Cook's desire to stay off the grid. Right, because we don't know exactly where he was going, exactly where he planned on being. We just know where he might have been last. Yes. So various groups and volunteers contributed to the land and sea search efforts. So search efforts included the state's emergency services, the volunteer marine search and rescue, and the Department of Park and Wildlife. Still, after five days of extensive searching, Cook could not be located. And remember, he has like none of his belongings. He has very few belongings with him, right? Yeah. On November 27, 
the final day of the search. In an email addressed to Sergeant Clifford, Jeremy, on behalf of his family, mentioned a cave which was 750 meters west of the campsite, which he wagered his brother would have been likely to explore, which would also make you take a flashlight. Yes. Due to the difficulty of safely searching in this area, it was determined unlikely that he was there and it was not searched. He was really into caves. He's probably in the cave. Dude, he would have had to have gone into the cave. Please tell me somebody has searched the cave. His bank statements showed that regular payments were still being made to a web page host company in Queensland. The payments continued after Cook's disappearance. Well, maybe that's automatic. It's 100% automatic. A police investigator contacted the company and was told that unfortunately the last communication with Cook was on the 12th of May in 2012 and that the payment was set up to be debited automatically. Boom. Of course. In April of 2014, local anthropologist and biologist Gary Muir undertook two explorations of the cave that Jeremy suggested, but concluded that there were no signs of recent human activity. Okay, so somebody did go check out the cave, but there's no sign that a human has been in the cave. Okay, so interesting. So a couple theories on this case, right? So, oh, side note, he has still not been found. Yes, so the cave exploration was the last thing and no signs of him. Still to this day, yeah. So a couple theories. One, he fell off the rocks and drowned, maybe at night when he was going to use the bathroom or something like that. Following his trip to the hardware store, there were six-meter swells with the possibility of 10-meter king waves. So it's very plausible that the water was extremely choppy and extremely violent that night Mm -hmm. or the nights following that. But his body has never been found. So if you remember that the O'Hayes case, there's a lot of rocks and cliffs and little caves and under areas that can definitely... Beach coves. Yeah, a ton of places where somebody could potentially get lodged in. But either way, the rocks are slippery. Another theory, if he didn't end up in the water, could be that he just got lost. So maybe trying to find a cave or something like that. This area is very remote. And remember, it took a full month for somebody to find the campsite. It's very possible that he could have wandered away to explore and not been able to find his way back. He was very aware of this area. He had traveled there intentionally and then gone back into town and back to his campsite twice. And he had done the Bibbleman track Previously, he might have even have been familiar with that area from his previous trek through there as Mm -hmm. well. But it's interesting that he's on this somewhat popular trek, but he's obviously far enough off the trail that it took a month to find his campsite. So he is intentionally moving away from civilization to set up his camp. Uh, Theory number three, shark attack. Outside chance, but there are sharks in the area and a lot of them. Yeah, which in most cases, sharks only attack due to mistaken identity. Like they think a human is food or a seal or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or if you've aggravated them in some way. I do find this particular theory very unlikely though, but I mean, anything's really possible. So, I mean, if you do look at a map, there are a lot of shark warnings right along the coast where this trek would be. So, I mean... It's a possibility. It's a possibility, but I do think that he would have had to have been in the water already. Maybe he fell off the cliff and then was attacked by a shark, and that's why his body hasn't been recovered. I mean, that could be. Another possibility would be a snake bite. So, snakes are prevalent in this area, but they really only prove fatal if untreated, which could have been the case, but I think that we might have found him in his tent Cook was very well-versed in survival skills and even had a phone in his tent. Right. So I don't think he would have wandered far away, but maybe when he was out exploring caves, maybe he got bit by a snake and couldn't find his way back. But then why wasn't his body found? Well, because he's not on trail. I mean, he's just like out there in the yeah, woods. true. Who knows? Yeah. Um, another option is him taking his own life. I don't think this is believable because he did buy lots of gear. Well, it's the new expensive gear in his car, right? I mean... We buy expensive gear sometimes, and we I wouldn't have even left it in my car. That would have made me nervous, but it's a weird thing to do. He did just go get more supplies, 
which had not been used yeah. in his tent, food that had not been eaten. I, I feel like that would be a weird thing to do if you were planning on taking your life. Yeah. So slightly more conspiracy theories. Maddie likes these He ones. faked his own disappearance. Kim, it could be. He really wanted to go off the grid and his brother had mentioned that he wanted to follow a pure life. So he left behind his unused full survival gear and shelter. Yeah, this reminds me of the one case where he had all the survival gear in his car, but he didn't take it with him and wandered into the woods. Remember, he was like a fan of the survivalist guy. Yeah. I mean, could it be something like that? He was seeing if he could survive without his gear. But again, why do you go to the store and buy new gear? Buy new food, buy more supplies, that type of thing. So on May 22 of 2014, so eight months after he went missing, his father, Roy, sent an email to the state's coroner office requesting that his disappearance be investigated. The state's coroner office re-evaluates the evidence and determines if a death has occurred, which obviously the family wants closure, right? He probably has a lot of loose ends that they are unable to tie up if he's still just a missing person versus having a death certificate, being able to tie up his finances. He's got a car in storage. He's got other things like that. Yeah. Which remember the coroners in Australia are very different to what the coroner is here. Right. So this would basically be like if they just called the detective here and said, or the police and said, I want an investigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A day later, the coroner's office wrote to the missing persons unit of Western Australia requesting all information that was available on Cook's disappearance. Then on September 12th in 2016, the coronial inquest into the disappearance of Rowan Wallace Cook in 2013 ruled that the 40-year-old is dead but could not find how he died. Obviously, because we don't have a body. Yeah. He was likely to have been a victim of Mother Nature and is unlikely to have survived. Right, because so much time has gone by now, I mean. Yeah. According to Sergeant Clifford, he did not believe anything unlawful occurred, such as setting out to harm himself or fake his own disappearance. Clifford hypothesized that Mr. Cook had gone rock fishing or exploring caves, and Mr. Cook had died as a result of misadventure. He noted there were several dangers in the area, including cliff, Falls, large swells, sharks, snakes, caves, and sinkholes. He said that there were six meter swells and king waves of 10 meters in the area, and the ocean was the most obvious threat. Yeah. And, and I would kind of tend to agree with that, but my assumption is purely based on where his tent was set up. In Sergeant Clifford's opinion, Mr. Cook probably died three or four days after he was last seen given the state of the campsite, which included well-organized rubbish that indicated that he had consumed a few days' worth of food. Right, so some of the food that he bought in town had actually been consumed. The coroner found beyond all reasonable doubt that the deceased is dead but was unable to find out how the death occurred or the cause of death. Right, which makes sense. I mean, without finding his body or finding more information, it would be really hard to identify what happened to him. Cook's family was accepting of the coroner's ruling. I think they probably already had an idea. But in his obituary in the Sydney Morning Herald, it read, Cook Rowan Wallace, 1973 to 2013, Younger son of Roy and Diane, brother to Jeremy, forever loved, never forgotten. So crazy story, missing at Aldridge Cove. I think this is just a bonker story. I mean, it it almost reminds me of like three of our stories combined. Yeah. And we'll go into our theories a little more in bonker talk, but we definitely wanted to give a shout out. Huge shout out so today. We have, we have a huge shout out to give to Sharna Lambert, who did the research on this case for us. Yeah. Thanks, Sharna. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. Yeah, this Sharna. Sharna. Looks right to me. Tell us if we're wrong. Um, I'll send you an extra sticker if we're wrong. <laughs> you did an amazing job, though. We really enjoyed reading, uh, having a case in Australia and 
having help with our research. You're amazing. And thank you so much yeah, for that. Thank you so, so much. All of this amazing research came from Shauna. Amazing. We also are going to switch over here to our bunker talk in a second. So if you want to know more about this case, click on over to that. But first, we have new Patreons. Yes. Yes. New Patreons. Indeed. So first off, thank you so much to our Patreons. You guys are amazing. We really, really appreciate you. It's so much fun to get new Patreons, to have new people interacting with us on all of our bonus stuff. There's also lots of bonus stuff from our trip. We are working on all the bonus footage from our trip. So we're going to have some GPS tracks on there. We're going to have a lot of videos on there. We're going to have a lot of fun stuff. And you'll get to hear about us almost dying probably multiple times. So come check it out. Who knows what this trip will entail? You never know what Maddie and I are going to get ourselves into. <laughs> so we have Julie Coper. Oh my God. How would you say that? Copper? Copper with a C-O-E? I don't know, man. <laughs> okay, Julie, let us know how you pronounce your name. But thank you so much for supporting us yes. on Patreon. Welcome to Patreon. And we also have Vicki Levins. Hi, Vicki. Thank you so much. She's another international. You guys, we have so many international Patreons too. It's so fun. Thank you so much for your support. Your guys' cards are in the mail. I do love the international postage stamps more. Yeah, they're like a little green leafy, like They're like a little thing. succulent. I know. They're super cute. Thank you so much for your support. And we so appreciate you guys. Get ready um, for all your bonus material. Get ready for all your bonus material. I know. I think this month, yeah, we had a lot last month and we have a lot this month coming out as well. And part of that is getting help with our research. Like we're really able to provide more. More content. Content. For yeah. So come and check us out. Thank you so much again, Shauna. Yes. Thank you. And thank you guys for coming and showing up and listening to us and... You guys are amazing. So thank you so much. And we will see you next week. Bye. I'm having my first coffee of the day at 1.44. I'm having my third coffee of the day at 1.44. And I did some drinking before this too. So... <laughs> Technically, I did drinking before I slept, so I mean... So I'm probably more fresh on the alcoholic train than medicine, but that's fine. We yeah. are drinking our Starbucks Double Shots, which is our go-to. It's coffee in a can. And it's I great. wish anything from Starbucks actually tasted like this. I know, right? Like from like their real stores. Yeah. I know, yeah. This is always our go-to. We usually pick it up at gas stations when we go hiking or camping. We drink it all the time. We're not sponsored. We're not sponsored. <laughs> We're not sponsored. Please sponsor us. Okay. In I don't know why that cracks me up so much <laughs> when we talk about something and then I'm well, here's We're the not thing. sponsored. Here's the thing. I always feel like if we mention something, we have to make it clear that we are not getting paid to mention it. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Well, especially because you mentioned that like we're sponsored for it. It's our go-to. We do. We I know. It, so it sounds like an advertisement. It's not. We are not sponsored. And we are definitely not sponsored by Starbucks. Although, how cool would that be? Okay. Focus up. Maddie likes to get distracted. I was going to say, they probably aren't going to sponsor two people that quit from their establishment. Well, they both quit from their establishment. We both worked at Starbucks and we no longer work at Starbucks. Oh, my gosh. One of our... Um, Patreons messaged me the other day and they're like, I used to work for Blockbuster too. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no way. <laughs> so we, funny. We bonded over Blockbuster. It's fine. Okay. I don't think that happened. It did happen. I will go find it <laughs> if I need to. If you want to continue on this denial, I will go find it. I don't I didn't cut it out. It's in the episode. Let us know what episode that is, you guys. Actually, I think it was the the young guy that went missing and his dad spent all of his... Theo Hayes. No. Mm -mm, the other one. Bush. Oh, maybe it was Theo Hayes that ran into the That's bush. what... Because he, he's oh, from yeah, Australia. Because you he were like, running. Theo Hayes ran into a bush. And I'm like, no, he ran into the bush. And you're like, That was what? me trying to... Fuck you. <laughs> I'm done. I'm quitting the podcast. It's over. <laughs> Go hire somebody else. <laughs> Will they help me with research? <laughs> Now I'm really quitting. <laughs> now this isn't a joke anymore. 
I'm done. <laughs> I'm putting my two weeks. Go take another one of your kids and do this podcast with them. You got other ones. I do have a few to choose from. I do. It's true. Okay. I think you should try to bring Cadence on here and then keep every little tiny fight that happens Not right in this chance room. chance in hell. While you sit two feet from her. <laughs> I'm actually taking... Cadence, the middle child, the 15-year-old. I'm taking her snowboarding tomorrow, you guys, and I feel like I need some Xanax or something in order to go because... <laughs> Did you know, <laughs> maybe so don't stressed. put this in the podcast, but if you take, apparently, I haven't done it, so oh, I don't know. Good. Clarify with that. I want to clarify that Whatever this is. haven't Maddie actually done, done this. It. But if you take four ibuprofen with four Advil, it gives you the same kind of effect as like a Xanax would. Yeah, I don't know if that's scientifically like backed or not. <laughs> it was, I saw it on Twitter. I don't know. I haven't tried it. I have no real evidence. <laughs> so that's, i okay. heard this. So tomorrow I'm going to take four ibuprofen and four Advil and see what happens. <laughs> Aren't they the same thing? They're definitely the same thing. Basically, you're, basically, you're just telling me to OD on no. ibuprofen. <laughs> They're the same thing. You have to take a lot of ibuprofen to overdose. Apparently four and four. No. <laughs> that just gives you the effect of a Xanax. But they're the same thing. Advil and ibuprofen. Ibuprofen's think, just the generic version of Advil. Yeah, but Advil it maybe has different... I don't. Are you sure it's Advil? I'll look at my phone after this and I will confirm <laughs> because my phone is charging. Because I decided not to plug in my phone last night. And just, Maddie likes to do that when she comes home late. I really do. I never plug in my phone. Also, she's like a rhinoceros coming into the house in the middle of the night. And I didn't even eat my McDonald's that I got on my way home last night. (laughs) I set it on my shelf and then I laid in my bed and fell asleep. Great. This is who I'm taking advice from. Somebody give me better advice, please. Okay. (laughs) So Well, and in my dream, I was like, I was like trying to tell myself not to jump off of the cliff, but then I kept on walking towards the edge. Like in my dream, I wanted to, I wanted to jump off the cliff, but like in my dream, I was like telling myself not to jump off the cliff. That literally sounds like my thought process every time I stand on a cliff edge. (laughs) (laughs) Just a thought, jump off the bridge, jump, take a step, take one more step forward. No, not going to do that. Don't do it. (laughs) Who driving on a bridge, drive off the bridge. Do it now. Nope. Don't do it. Don't. (laughs) So apparently Maddie and I have some strange thoughts when we're in dangerous places. I don't know. I found out recently, actually, that intrusive thoughts aren't something that everybody gets. Really? Yeah. Okay, so you guys, do you get intrusive thoughts or have intrusive dreams? Because apparently Maddie and I do, but apparently it sounds like the rest of the world does not. So just curious, is there something wrong with us? (laughs) Do you get intrusive thoughts? Or Or is it attached to like the way that we crave adrenaline and things like that, like, or our lack of fear response, because Maddie and I both also lack the fear gene a little bit where things that should scare us don't scare us. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they're connected at all. I don't know. I mean, we talk ourselves out of them. It's fine. 